and talk about the, the film. Um, and um, yeah, I had, a, I, had a, I had a few things to talk to, to issues to sort of raise about it, and I think questions to ask, ask Andrew actually, and your kind of um, your position of kind of uh, as, a, as, a, as a veterinary scientist and kind of knowing about uh, dogs in particular, kind of like having Googled the film and kind of like found out a bit about what the director's intentions were. Um, I mean, the di director says the film's about a fear about minorities, in a sense it's an allegory about um, the, the, the fear in Hungary, and I think probably a fear that we can now see kind of like across the world um, about um, race, um, in this particular case about um, miscegenation, the kind of like the, um, the, 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 the crossing of, of different species, well, uh, racial pedigree lines in this particular case. Um, and if we look at the kind of like the, the kind of like the, the history of thinking about animals um, in the West, then we kind of like we can see that animals are generally kind of like seen as outside of culture. They're in the realm of nature, um, and um, historically, um, from particularly from the like from the period of um, the slave trade through to colonialism, we can see um, human beings being put in those categories as well. Um, and so it's been kind of like possible to kind of like um, through, the, through the ways that we cre create species boundaries by differentiating humans from animals, sometimes human beings are put in the same position as animals are as well. Um, and I think the most the starkest example of that would have been the slave trade. Um, and um, I think some of the reviews also kind of like compare the story told in this film to the film Spartacus. Um, which I've not seen, but it's also apparently kind of like um, drawing on the Roman Empire and the slave trade um, and um, the, um, the, the sort of pitching of, of, of humans against um, animals and humans against each other in the, um, in the amphitheater. Um, but one of the questions that it raised to, raised to me was um, actually um, if we make this, if we think about the film as about dogs as opposed to about just humans, then actually I think it would have been interesting to watch it together with the film Pedigree Dogs Exposed um, because they're probably um, subject to much more violence than um, uh, sort of, you know, um, mixed pedigree um, dogs are um, because of the ways that kind of breeding kind of like introduces um, deformities into um, pedigree dogs. Um, I inflicted this film on um, the students taking my course Humans and the species earlier this semester, um, and um, I think it's, 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 it's kind of like interesting that um, these pedigree dogs who don't feature that much in the film, we see a sort of slightly snooty, um, snooty, um, what do they call those spotty dogs? I've forgotten the name. Uh, from my, my head. Thank you, Dalmatians. Um, you see a slightly snooty Dalmatian. But we don't get much kind of like reference to what the life of these creatures are like who are kind of like bred purely for their aesthetic standards um, and to such an extent that actually the, the breeding and our aesthetic desires actually create a lot of suffering. Um, I, I thought the film raised questions about how the relationship of children to animals as well. I thought the, the, the character Lily um, was almost, you know, presented almost as a sort of pre-socialized creature, um, like the dog who was um, not, um, you know, because she was pure, she was able to see beyond the social categories raised by human beings. And we can see the kind of like the rather sort of uneven parallels between her story and Hagen's um, story, the story of the dog. Um, and then the other kind of like um, question which, um, I really wanted to ask Andrew about, actually. Well, two questions I wanted to ask Andrew about. One was um, the relationship with animals with music. And I know, actually, music is a speciality of yours as well as, as animals. But uh, there's also that film about the weeping camel, the story of the weeping camel in which it's set in Mongolia, in which um, a, a mother camel refuses to, um, refuses to um, suckle a baby camel, and she's eventually kind of like, um, persuaded and kind of like cajoled into doing this by playing the violin and she starts to cry and then finally she's kind of reunited with her um, baby um, and um, this this kind of like theme comes up I think time and again when um, we kind of like talk about human relationships with animals and I just wondered what whether Andrew could comment on, on, on that and then the other 
question also that I, I, I wondered whether Andrew would comment on is actually Hagen as a character, how dog-like is he? Is he, you know, is he actually a human character, really, in disguise, or is he, is he doing things which a, which, a, which a dog would actually do, you know, particularly kind of like in the taking of revenge, um, you know, how anthropomorphic are we being there? Yeah, over to you, <laughs> Andrew, and then... <laughs> well, actually, I was thinking of another film, because the, the mm -hmm. I, 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 it's quite an emotional film, actually, it's quite hard to come out of that space, I find mm -hmm. it quite moving, actually. Very, very um, but uh, Pedigree Dogs Exposed, yes, about a few days ago I saw a film called um, The Secret Life of Pets, it was on a flight. And it's kind of the mirror image of this film, and in this film it's, it's about uh, pedigree dogs in Manhattan, privileged dogs who end up in the, the gutters and sewers. And it's got scenes which are, it's an animation, but it's got scenes which are very similar to these, the dog catcher scenes we got in there, except it, it, it's, kind of, it's kind of flipped. So, yeah, I was interested in this idea of, of the, under, the underdog and, and kind of uh, class and breeding and pedigree in dogs, which is, a, mm. a, is a, a, an interesting issue. And there, there has been kind of work uh, done in that recently, um, mainly arising from, as you mentioned, Becky, um, concerns about um, uh, inbreeding, uh, there's a, the pedigree dogs exposed, all that sort of stuff. So it's created a bit of interest in um, Dog, dog class, if you like, or or, or dog, um, dog species. So that that was kind of in in my mind that 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 other film as well. And although it's it's a much lighter film, it actually is a is a very well observed film in terms of, of dog behaviour. Of course, it's 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 an animation, and um, and there's bits of hyperbole in it. But there's quite there's quite a lot of hyperbole in that in that film as well. Um, I mean, for me, that film was about the mad sort of bad and, and, and dangerous dog and what, how, they, how that's constructed. I mean, on one or two occasions, uh, madness was mentioned. Someone said the dogs are rabid. Um, so it kind of um, gets into that whole thing of, where, of dog massacres and so on, which is historically was, was, was an important thing in uh, the history of human-animal relations. But also, of course, with, with Hagen. So Hagen was turned, um, he was turned bad by the, the the guy that wanted to fight him. So your point, I, th I think for me it was how, how much are we willing to forgive dogs? You know, there was a certain satisfaction when he when he goes back and he, he gets his revenge on these people who abused him. But that's such a really relevant question in relation to the Dangerous Dogs Act, which is widely considered to be a bad piece of legislation of how we, how we deal with dogs that are sort of what's bad or, or dangerous, and and what what would the outcome be for for Hagen? You know, can, is is you know, was he justified, and how how would that how would that be viewed at the end? I was wanting to know, you know, what is going to happen. Um, the father says, "Give them a bit more time." It doesn't it, it doesn't end in a very promising note for those dogs, and particularly, is is there any way that Hagen would be? Um, forgiven for his acts, um, because actually in, 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 in Mad Dogs and Rabid Dogs, one of the, certainly within the veterinary literature, the clinical veterinary literature of the 19th century, rabies, and, and which was synonymous with madness and, and badness in dogs, was thought to destroy the moral sense of the dog. That's why, that's what, that's why they went mad. So the dog would, you would just read descriptions of the dog entering a town with an intent to do damage, to find people and, and other beings and, and kill them because his moral sense was um, destroyed by uh, this disease. Um, and uh, so, I mean, I was, there was a lot of resonances in, in, in that film for me on that, on that aspect of it, this sense of the, of the dog being turned and then what happens, can he be brought back and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, it's things out of place, so dogs out of place, you know, those dogs are not in the right place uh, in, in the town, in the, the, in the city, they're, they're out of place, so they need to be um, turned up. Um, <coughs> the other most moving bit for me was the scene with the euthanasia uh, in the, the shelter, and I, uh, 
the, the woman that was, was, was carrying that out, carrying it out quite sympathetically and probably technically very well, but um, it reminded me very strongly of as a scene in uh, Disgrace by uh, Tootsie, of, of where that woman could almost be the character that was, was, was for me, was described in that book. So this idea of um, uh, euthanasia and, and um, I got quite a lot of this sort of eugenics coming into, I mean, that, that, that dog place had a lot of similarities to um, camps and chimneys and railway lines and things like that. So it was quite, uh, quite cool. Um, the music thing, I'm not, I, 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 I'm not so sure how to comment about that, um, other than it was a great device in the film, and it, it, it linked the, the film together really well, and it was very moving because, because the music opens up the emotions as well, and the way the dogs all responded, I thought was, was, was a beautiful piece of, um, beautiful piece of filming. And uh, I, I, terribly sad for the little terrier got shot. That was an uh, awful, <laughs> awful moment. And I wondered if in the credits, if they were allowed to run, if we would get more credits about the dogs in the film, because I, I, I was listed second. That I, I just wondered if the other dogs uh, were actually. Um, I think they won an award. I think the dogs won an award. They won, they so won the Palm Dog. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I, and, I, and I, I did a bit of Google background research. I didn't get very far, but apparently Hogan was played by two dogs. Yeah. So twin Labrador crosses, presumably. Um, yeah. But how they managed, apparently it took six months to um, socialise the dogs. I'm not quite sure what that means. Um, that was the, all the information I could get about how you managed to get a crowd of dogs. Act in that way. Um, um, so I should uh, tell you a little bit of my background. Um, so in addition to um, I mean, uh, the person who introduced us said a little bit about my having done work with animals back in India. But apart from that, uh, some of my initial work in British academia was has been on dogs and the kind of uh, integration of control and care in the ways in which we relate to dogs, things like breeding, euthanasia, neutering, um, looking at different dogs in different places, street dogs, pet dogs, so on and so forth. And uh, over the course of doing that piece of work, what I've also done is to kind of think about the relationships between two uh, spaces of um, what can be called more than human social change, which is animal protection and conservation, which are normally held quite apart. And I was trying, um, uh, over the course of my work on dogs and also conservation, I started thinking thinking about the entanglements between these two different spaces. Um, now, I've never been asked to think critically, or worse, speak critically about a film before. Um, so when I, I'm, I'm, I'm into films, but they always, have, they always have been entertainment for me. So when Amit asked me to do this, I was like, oh my god, I don't want to do it. So what I've done is to uh, write down some of my thoughts in an effort to kind of appear a little more coherent than what I think I actually am. So I'm going to read it out to you. Uh, feel free to stop me at any point or ask me to slow down or ask for clarifications. <coughs> so, okay, so tales about dogs being chased and rounded up by municipal authorities are not new. Right from Lady of the Tram uh, at Taratatui, this has been a recurrent theme in Disney. But this film is different. For one, <coughs> the animals don't speak human language even if they're anthropomorphized at some points. But more importantly, the film is gritty, dark, and real in its unreality. It's a serious, even severe film. And it is this severity and weight that makes most people see the film first and foremost as a parable, as an allegorical tale about Europe's downtrodden and disenfranchised, to use the words <coughs> of one film critic, as a subversive reverie about the prosperous classes in any city and their fear of what lies beneath, and a parable of the resentment in all families, broken and unbroken, to use the words of another reviewer. It is meant to be a tale about past Soviet rule in Hungary and about the current racist proclivities of Hungary's third largest political party. This is how most serious films and fiction with animal protagonists are interpreted. Right from Kafka's A Report to an Academy to Orwell's Animal Farm and Hitchcock's The Birds and even Karen Joy Fowler's We Are All Beside Ourselves, all of these pieces of work have been interpreted as parables. But what if we take the film and its animal characters at face value? Indeed, the director says in an interview in IndieWire that the film has its origins in the horror he felt when he visited a dog pound. What if the film is, at its heart, 
a story about nature society interactions. To me, if the film is a parable, then it is a parable about our relationships with non-human nature. More specifically, the film asks us to think about the kinds of non-human nature we will tolerate in a world that we increasingly think of as human society or at best social nature. In the film, mixed breed dogs are either taxed or are impounded and killed. Only purebred dogs are seen as legitimate inhabitants of human society. This is not specific to dogs or to Hungary. In general, we are willing to accommodate in our spaces only those non-human beings that are either under human control or that are human artifacts. Breeding is in some ways the ultimate expression of human control over and production of non-human nature far more than killing us. Through breeding, we create and manage non-human life so that it suits our purposes and needs and meets our needs, whether basic or aesthetic, like um, Rebecca said, or otherwise. We have come to accept breeding as so integral a part of our interactions with nature that we think of dogs like Hagen as mixed breed. Even charities like Dog the Dogs Trust talk about the different kinds of breeds that go into the dogs that they put up for adoption, as though dogs cannot exist independently of human intervention in their reproduction. Breeding is now part of our interactions with not only those animals that are considered domestic and that are used directly in human society, but also those animals that are considered wild. <coughs> Captive reproduction programs are proliferating in the field of conservation and are seen as win-win strategies that allow us to enjoy the beauty of wild nature, even while continuing to destroy it in pursuit of other human needs. Through breeding, we make space for only those natures that are produced for our purposes and that are at least seemingly under our control. The film thus makes us think about the animals that we're willing to cohabit with. Well-trained dogs and cats, yes, but not pigeons or gulls or rats, or even transgressive dogs and cats that do not fit within our sense of order in human society. I'm sure all of you know that Britain had free living dogs till up, till up to the 19th century. They were all systematically eradicated as pests and health risks. We are now doing the same to free living cats, though in the name of animal welfare. Our ideas of animal well-being morph to suit our ideas of human well-being and our sense of what a proper human society should look like. If this is our response to four-legged creatures that are less than half our size, it makes me wonder why we support the protection of lions, tigers, pandas, and elephants in lands far away. How can we ask this of people in those lands when we are totally unwilling to live with smaller and less dangerous creatures like cockroaches, mice, and pigeons? I don't know whether to laugh or cry when I see news reports of dangerous gulls in Britain. It also explains why rewilding programs almost always fail or result in the renewed persecution of those rewilded creatures. If we cannot learn to cohabit with pigeons and free-living dogs, how on earth can we learn to cohabit with wolves? I wonder what techniques of control, even if presented as positive reinforcement, were deployed on the dogs used in the film. After all, all these dogs, the ones that were used in the film, are products of the very same human control of nature that the film tries to question. Second, what does it say about us as a society when our main response to the film is to see it, see it as, a parable, as a parable of intra-human relations? The ethical and political negation of non-human nature and our profound anthropocentrism 